Well, good morning, good Monday morning. It's Message of Hope time. I hope you really enjoy Gordon's and I's discussion yesterday as we looked at what's on the horizon, what is the encounter you need in your life. And last week I had the privilege of sharing with you those God encounters, stillness of the night on the road around the table. And again, I'm up and doing the message of hope again. It's because I had a bit of a quiet time in July and August and put the weight on other people. So it's my turn again. But this week, actually, we're going to do something quite different. Helen and I are going to alternate each day. And we thought, well, it's the last week of August. And in England, anyway, it's called the late summer break. And it is the sort of last week we all consider before kids go back to school. Supposedly, life returns to normal. And um, at the end of this week, we have what is called our summer bank holiday. And so we thought, well, let's go summer thinking. And so I want to spend this week and just making us think outside the box a bit. I wonder when you think of holidays, what has been your dream? Certainly COVID-19 with all the quarantine regulations, flight difficulties, etc. Most of us have mostly stayed in England and not risked it. I know my neighbours were thinking, shall we, shan't we? went to France and bless them, within 24 hours, they've got the quarantine, which they didn't want because he's a school teacher. So we'll hear this, that story, I'm sure, when he comes home. But during holidays, we often have dream places, places we love to go and walk. You know, when we're considering it, they're places we want to explore, travel. And so Helen and I are going to take you on a tour travel guide of biblical places. We're going to go visit some of the mountains of the Bible, some of the rivers and beaches, and of course there'll always be some curveballs in there. But I wonder if you've ever really had time, and I haven't really, so it's been a good time, um, discipline for me. I've had to really sit down and look at these biblical places. We read about them, we think we know them, but have we really taken time to go and explore them? And maybe by the end of our time describing these things, you'll put it on your bucket list and say, actually, I want to go there. I remember when it was Gordon's 60th birthday and one of his bucket list places was Rome. And we, so we went to Rome and just outside the city walls of Rome is the burial place of the early Christians. And it's on that Agrippa Road, the famous road that Paul walked down and had the encounter. And as, you, as we arrived there, there was a young 22-year-old Italian guide who took us round. And as I just discovered some of the history, the historical representations of, of the pictures and the frescoes and images I saw around me, I suddenly realised that when I read my Bible, I was reading it in a different place. And she told me, because we noticed as we walked down into the catacombs of these early believers and where they hid, there were so many um, sculptures and engravings of a shepherd. And she said, and obviously was not a Christian, but she said, oh yes, the early believers had this understanding of a good shepherd. They had this saying that there was a good shepherd. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And she said, and if you notice these sculptures, the toga on the shepherds was very short above their knees. That's what a, a boy would wear or someone who didn't have much money. If we think of it in our language, it would be like a boy wearing shorts rather than long pants. If you didn't have much money, came from a poor place, you just stuck the short toga on. It meant that you were a worker, that you had to do the work. But as Rome began to grow, the influence of people on the outskirts of Rome and their agriculture got more and more significant and they got very wealthy. So many of those who owned sheep became very wealthy. And when they came into Rome, which was like the New York of the day, you wanted to dress smart, look smart, very fashion conscious. If you came in in your short toga, everyone looked at you and said, oh, you're a schoolboy. So this um, Italian girl explained to us that what began to happen was the shepherds began to wear long togas. They began to get rich fabrics because they were having money from all their sheep coming into Rome. And so if you read John chapter 10, you 
suddenly get a whole new view of Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd. Some of you have a hireling. Now the hireling didn't, were the people who went into Rome in long togas and weren't ready to run. And I never forget that this Italian girl looked around. She said, you see the images they have? The toga's always short because that represented, this is a true shepherd, a shepherd that's ready to run for you and save your life. So you see, just that visit to Rome and listening to that girl talk about shepherds changed the whole of John chapter 10 for me. And suddenly I thought, he is a good shepherd. He's not dressed to impress. He's got a short toga and he is ready to run for me. Well, today, where am I going to take you? Taking you to Rome quickly, but I really want to take you to Mount Hermon. Now, I'm going to try and be your tour guide and just give you a flavour. So we are walking into Israel and we're looking at a mountain. This mountain actually straddles Lebanon through to Syria and is um, part of the Golan Heights, quite a restricted place of access these days. The Mount Hermon is actually not a single mountain peak, it is a tri-mountain peak, three mountain peaks, and each of the heights is very similar, about just less than 10,000 feet, um, 9,200 feet or 2.8 meters, if you prefer that. Um, it is a cluster of mountains, and today it's hard to get there, but you can get there. They have what they call the Herman Reserve Area, for those of you who are skiers and skateboarders, because there's incredible areas of snow for about 50 days up there, and also walks, mountain biking, and mountain hikes is all over there. Mount Herman is known to be very important to the area because actually it seems to just catch the water, precipitation, rain, because it's a high mountain in a very flat, arid area. And so Mount Hermon is usually in the mist and the rain. It does have seasonal winters. Those three caps are often covered with snow the whole year through. It does have spring snowfalls, which create rains and streams that run off the mountain. And this meltwater from the snow actually runs off the western and the south bases of this mountain and forms these beautiful bubbling brooks and streams and rivers. And in fact, all these streams and rivers merge together to form the famous Jordan River that we know. Also, Part of these streams and rivers fall off and form a very fertile basin at the bottom of this river where vineyards, pine trees, oak trees, poplar trees and the famous cedar trees grow. Mount Hermon is often nicknamed the Snowy Mountain, the Grey-Haired Mountain or the Mountain of Snow. Some people call it the eyes of the nation because it just stands and watches over the area around and today Israel uses it as its place for its early warning system. All through the centuries Mount Hermon has been recognised as a place of spiritual significance. Many temples are there, right back Baal worship and that has been there and actually the very name Hermon in Hebrew means consecrated and in the Arabic language means a sacred place. So there is something about this mountain or mountain range, these three peaks, Mount Hermon's range, that carries snow, carries water, carries a spiritual presence, carries abundance and water. In the Bible we find that the Mount Hermon is mentioned 15 times. It's mentioned in Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Chronicles, three times in the Psalms and once in the Song of Songs. So it, and it always is mentioned to allude to that place where you go to find water. The Psalmist, you know, in um, Psalm 42, that beautiful Psalm of all his waters, you can tell it's called the Psalm from Hermon. He was obviously up that mountain in the mist and the water and the bubbling brooks and he could feel the water coming over him and it reminded him of the love of God. In the Song of Songs it talks about 
going up Mount Hermon and the place where the lions and the animals live and this special place of a mysterious atmosphere. Maybe the most famous one which I'm going to read now is Psalm 133. How wonderful it is, how pleasant for God's people to live together in harmony. It is like that precious oil running down Aaron's head and beard, down to the collar. It is like the dew on Mount Hermon falling on the hills of Zion. This is the promised blessing of God, life that never ends. So now I want you to imagine this incredible mountain range, three peaks covered with snow, the abundance of water bubbling, providing into that Jordan. And then the, um, the psalmist is saying, you see, this harmony and atmosphere is like oil, but it's also like dew. You see, unity provides a saturation, a wetness. When you walk on Mount Hermon, it is known as the mountain of moisture and wet. If you go there to walk and hike, it is that tangible misty rain that just saturates you even when you don't know it. When you walk on this mountain, you cannot help but get wet. You don't even know it, but when you come off, you are soaked with the atmosphere of Mount Hermon. And this is what David is saying, come on, I want you to learn to live together. I want you to know how to have the oil, but I want you to get this dew, this saturation, this wetness that so permeates you that you as a people carry the blessing and the wetness, just like on Hermon. You can't help it. When we begin to walk together, we can't help but carry the blessing of God. One other just interesting fact from the tour guide. Um, Several of the scholars say that they believe that Mount Hermon, these triple mountains, is actually the mountain where Jesus was transfigured. It's where he took his disciples and he lost his head in the mist and clouds. He was glorified. It's a thin place where the glory of God and earth meet in the wetness, that dew, that atmosphere. So next time you think about Mount Hermon, I want you to think about going to a place of abundance. Think about this mountain that carries a mist and a presence and a wetness all the time, all year round. Think about this mountain which just has a liberal abundant supply of the waters and blessings of God. Think of this mountain that actually supplies and crafts one of the greatest rivers and provides a plain of fertility the cedars of Lebanon. Well, where did they grow? On Mount Hermon. And those cedars of Lebanon were told and represent and stand as legacy. So I wanna pray for you today. Father, I pray today that we will be those people that ascend the hill of the Lord. That's what David says to you. He says, come, ascend the hill of the Lord. What is the hill? Hermon. And the Father, I pray that as we lift our faces into those clouds and the mist and the wetness of your presence soaks us, that we will feel that oil of your blessing upon our lives. God, where we feel dry, I pray, God, we will ascend the hill of the Lord. I pray that we'll find those places of wetness where you will saturate us and then from our lives will overflow an abundance of the wetness of God. Come on, just put your face in that mist. Let the blessing of God come upon you. Hear the cry of the Song of Songs. Come to him and let all his waters wet you. God really bless you today. And I hope as you pick up your Bible and you see Herman or the, or the mountain, it will make you think of this special snowy place where you always get wet. God bless you.